Erica Dewan, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to talk about this, this book that I did not know I needed until I read it. And it's called Digital Body Language. And my first question is like, why did you write this book? Why does the world need this at this point? I grew up as a shy and introverted girl to a family of Im Indian immigrants. And I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And for much of my life, I struggled to find my voice. I was navigating between my broken Hindi that my parents spoke at home. And then at the same time, I was also navigating my accented English in school. One of the things that I was able to develop a knack on as I struggled with my own language skills was deciphering other people's body language from looking at the popular girls and understanding what confidence looked like with your head high and direct eye contact to looking at some of the older kids who seemed cool or popular if they had slouched shoulders during school assemblies. Body language became something I was passionate about. It helped me understand how to signal confidence and trust, even if I didn't feel it fully myself. It helped me get ridiculously competitive job opportunities in companies. But what I realized about five years ago was that today, body language no longer just makes up roughly 70% of communication like it did in the past. Today, in, wor in worlds where we're leading global, virtual, multi-generational, matrix, remote teams, we are all immigrants to a new language. And that is a new language called digital body language. We need to be able to connect, build trust, not only when we're in a room with one another, but when we're connected from afar. That's why I wrote this book. Similar to my own journey as an Indian immigrant, learning body language, I want everyone to navigate this new world we're in as immigrants to digital body language. Mm. And it's interesting because you, know, you were able to decipher body language without necessarily having a Rosetta Stone because of context, because of, cl of clues, because of you did something and there was a response or these people did something, and there was a response the digital body language, it's almost like there's a void. Like you don't, you have no idea. Like you, you tell the story about your, your, what your assistant, uh, Jim, who you thought everything was going great. And then you check in six weeks later and he's about ready to quit. And you had no idea. Like how, how can we, uh, like, are there clues that we're missing or do we really, do we really need you as the Rosetta stone with your sensitivities to language or, you know what I'm asking? Like, what was implicit in traditional body language now has to be explicit in our digital body language. One of the mm. biggest things I learned just through my own career and in my research for this book is that we should never assume that someone is just okay if they write responsive emails or they say okay in an email. We have to make sure that we are truly reading between the lines and taking that extra step to value others visibly. In the story that you're mentioning, Howard, I, I talk about uh, how I was leading a new intern that was working with me remotely. I thought everything was great, uh, but sometimes I was very busy. During calls, I would sometimes show up 10 minutes late. I would rush him to get to the answer. Sometimes I would pick up other people's calls during my call with him because there was a lot going on, and I assumed that that would be okay. Turns out six weeks later, Jim felt really disrespected. He thought he was gonna get more insight into the business. I thought that everything was great because he kept delivering for me and he almost quit. I was able to resolve and solve this issue by taking a step back and understanding why my digital body language mattered. I started valuing him visibly. We took time for the virtual water cooler effect and we were able to build trust in a way that created a multi-year long relationship working together. This is just an example pre-pandemic. You can imagine that in the last year, the importance of digital body language has grown exponentially. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what are the what are the big, like when you started thinking about this book, do you, write, you have another very successful book? Um, and like, what got you thinking like this is needed? What, 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 was, what were some of the triggers, whether it was you know, personally or client work that, that said like, this is more than just idiosyncratic things that I'm hearing, but it's a, a sort of a cultural crisis. 
Six years ago, after I published my first book called Get Big Things Done, The Power of Connectional Intelligence, I, I traveled the world. I worked with a lot of CEOs and leaders on how to foster effective collaboration in a 21st century world. And as I really worked with team after team, I kept seeing the same patterns that were a bit different and unresolved. I kept seeing questions like, how do we connect with those in different ages and working styles? Why is there so much misunderstanding at work? Why is there so much anxiety and confusion? And what I realized is that one of the root causes of this was there was no rule book for how to communicate and understand one another digitally. Even those that were working in global companies, that were working in dispersed teams, individuals that were working on the same floor in the same office, were on conference calls together, were emailing each other back and forth, and were dealing with a lot more misunderstanding than clarity. And so back in 2016, I set out to write a new rule book, a rule book that would move us from the five love languages or crucial conversations, which were very much books written for face-to-face -face traditional body language to a rule book for how we can connect when we're in person and even from afar. And I never would have expected that everyone anywhere would need it as much as they do now. Uh-huh, right. You, you didn't release that virus, did you? <laughs> this wasn't part of pre-book marketing. <laughs> Um, I'm gladly proud that I did not, and, but at the same time, I am so excited to bring it to all of those, uh, not only in the workplace, but those with families that want to stay connected, those that want to reimagine their weddings, their baby showers, using digital body language, those that are in communities focusing on activism or fundraising. We can use digital body language in ways that we never would have expected before. Right. So I'm, I'm going to start with one of my own um, revelations from the book which is like, I realized that I really look down on emojis and people who use emojis. And I think it's because I'm a snob, right? In fact, there were two, like, I, I was part of a company where they were using emojis left and right. And I, I got, this is how passive aggressive I got. I started writing smiley face emoji in text at the end of the sentence, just because I was so pissed off at all the emojis. And reading your book, I realized like, okay, so they are serving a purpose. It's not frippery. It's not a dumbing down language. It's a necessary invention for the digital world. Can you talk a little bit about how, how that works? Emojis are like the new facial expressions in our modern day world when we can't read each other's cues. If we were going to send a um, share a message with someone if we knew they were on the verge of tears when we saw them face to face we might adjust our tone a bit <laughs> if we knew they were extremely excited we may adjust our tone if we knew they were angry we may adjust our tone when we're working virtually sending an email sending a text sending an im we don't have those cues i like to say we're tone deaf in many ways and so taking that extra step to think about how you can get creative in the use of digital body language something that I recommend versus shying away from. Emojis can infuse uh, a level of energy, excitement, uh, or happiness or sadness into your communication. What we do find is emoji use does skew younger, but I'll say that that's changing pretty quickly. Five years ago, emojis were not common in corporate workplaces. In the last year, that has exponentially changed. We're on the wild, wild west of gifts and memes and emojis in the workplace. I think my best rule of thumb here is to know your audience. If you're trying to build a connection, if you know your team, throw in them an emoji or two and don't be shy about it. If you are uh, someone who is you know, meeting with a prospect client for the first time, maybe err on the side of formality, but don't be shy about using your own authentic style. And especially men, I encourage to throw in an emoji or two. It can often help showcase that you're casual and friendly. Uh huh. Right. What what came to me when you talked about it's the new you know facial expressions is this you know the idea of like you know micro expressions like can I have an emoji that's like happy but hiding terror or like like it's it seems like it's a way you can lie it's a it's a really easy way to lie like that old cartoon on the internet nobody knows you're a dog. Technology creates masks. It's easier to forego formalities to hide and maybe. Uh, use an emoji to act like you're happy, but actually signal passive aggressiveness. And mm -hmm. one of the things I decode in my book is some of the different ways that emojis can play out in the same way that 
other punctuation tools like all caps or multiple exclamation points or multiple periods like an ellipses. These have different meanings in today's world. For example, an all caps message saying okay in all caps for some can feel like shouting, for others it can feel like excitement. A, uh, you know, okay with multiple question marks. For some can feel like friendly and fun. For others, it can feel accusatory. This is the examples of the brave new world of digital body language where we are in. And my key lesson here is that we are not all the same and we can't assume that we will all get what others mean. So the first step is to assume the best intent. Take that extra step if you are confused to know when to pick up the phone, when to get clarity. And if not, avoid getting emotionally hijacked by a symbol or a punctuation mark mm. and move forward in a way that gives everyone the benefit of the doubt. Right. And I love that you're talking about, you know, di from different cultures, because it seems like really we're talking about digital body languages as opposed to a, to a single one. Because I, I remember the first time I was really face to face with other cultures, I was giving talks in Germany and I had been giving the same talk in the US and there was laughter and engagement. And I gave the, I was doing a, a morning presentation in Germany and after about 45 minutes, um, they had a little break and I ran desperate to find the host. I said, what am I doing wrong? He's like, no, it's fine, it's good. Like, but nobody's like smiling or laughing or even looking at me. They look, they look like they're dead. Says no, no. We were enjoying. We were really enjoying it. I could tell, you know. So that um, assuming that there is a a language um, can fall flat, and there's there may not be anyone to talk to. There may not be a host to say how how is this landing. Um, so how how can we find out how it's landing? The truth is, is that we all are using different digital body languages. And the answer is we're, and they aren't all the same. Similar to regional dialects, we are using different cues and signals that are shaping what others may read into or not read into in our messages. I'm gonna use a parallel, Howard, from your story. In, in one of my examples in my book, I interviewed a woman named Rachel who talked about how some of her junior marketing team members would talk about why is this German client so rude in emails? Because they were very direct and to the point. And uh, she had to help them understand that they're, they're not being rude, they're just German. It's just the way of the culture. Similarly, uh, you know, I had a, a client who, a man who's a British a leader of a team, but he manages a global team. And some of his Brazilian colleagues found him so off-putting because he would use words like best regards. Uh, not multiple emojis or intensive adverbs, which, which is very common in the fluid Brazilian culture. Mm. And so the reality is, is that digital body language is different across cultures. We are not all the same. Even in northern parts of the United States, there's much more of a culture of getting to the point, starting on time on a Zoom call in southern parts of the United States. We may start with some niceties and talk about the weather for a few minutes before we dive in. Digital body language is different around the world, and it's our opportunity to take this moment to reflect on our own styles, what signals we are sending so that we can be more inclusive of those that are different from us. Mm, I love that idea of inclusivity, and it goes along with, I think, the flip side of that, which is we can learn how to be more tolerant of other styles. Because I remember when I first started learning Myers-Briggs, which I don't use and I don't find particularly you know, valid and helpful, but the like the the meta idea is that we have different ways of seeing the world, and someone else's way is as valid as my own and can help inform me, so that we can start to see these differences with curiosity and see them as potential strengths rather than just this person's rude or that person's too formal or that person's stuck up. Exactly. In my book, I talk specifically about how can you be more inclusive, even among introverts versus extroverts in digital body language. Uh, for example, I talk about how do you connect with introverts? Well, introverts need time to process ideas. So send agendas 48 hours in advance of the meeting if you really want their input, because they need time to process versus just putting them on the spot and in the Zoom meeting. They were already struggling with this, with airtime issues in the office. Hmm. So being thoughtful about it can go a long way. On the extrovert side, manage their airtime to avoid over-talking, use breakout rooms, have a meeting moderator, or use the chat. And these simple tactics can go a long way to taking Myers-Briggs, but actually applying it in a digital world. And that was really my mission with the book, that we needed new rules for a new era. That's what hmm. digital body language is all about. 
Great. So I want to get into the rules that are um, beautifully alliterative. Um, but for, first, let's talk about Zoom. So before before I came here, I asked my wife if she had any questions for you. And the only thing she's like, she was busy, like she really didn't have time to, she's an introvert, so she didn't really have time to process it. But she did say, ask about cats. <laughs> like how many cats is too many cats? And, and I do know like, like there you know, I've seen meetings where we're like, I can see like the cat's anus like, going back and forth. <laughs> Like what talk, let's talk about Zoom because it's become such a pervasive phenomenon. We've had Slack for a while, we've gotten used to email, but Zoom is this new world. What, what, what can you tell us about Zoom and how we need to think about it and act? Zoom is this new world and uh, it is our world right now. And it is our world here to stay as we move to hybrid teamwork where some people will be in the office, but we want to include those that are working remotely. And so we have to think differently about all these different ways of engaging. My general rule of thumb is to be yourself as you think about your video background and who's around you. I, I think that pets are okay to a certain extent if there's high trust with the other individuals that you're communicating with and if it's not a distraction. If you're not using the mute button just to ignore or multitask instead of being thoughtful with others. If it's a business or professional meeting, err on the side of leaving your pets in another room uh, or children or whoever it may be, uh, but just simply showcasing and using your own body language can be effective to, sh to showcasing that you're listening in meetings. So for example, when you're presenting in a Zoom meeting, look into the camera. It not only signals to others that you care about them, even though you can't see them, they feel more connected to you because you're looking into the camera. Another thing you can do is make sure you're far away from the camera enough so that they can see your hand expressions, but also not too far that they can't see your face. Exactly. And last but not least, always arrive on prepared. If you show up prepared, it's like the new first impression. These are simple things, but they go a long way in creating that culture of trust. So I didn't answer your question of cats or no cats. I think it's up to you by knowing your audience. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Can you critique me for a second? Because, because so my first question is, um, I'm not looking into the camera because I'm looking. I'm, I'm, I'm being polite in my world and making eye contact with you, who's a good seven inches lower than the camera. Um, I've seen people spend hundreds of dollars on teleprompters with a monitor underneath it. So now I'm looking directly at the camera and ignoring you. Is there a difference? Like, is for for you? Is one better than the other? Howard, you have a beautiful video background. I would say your video background is better than mine. I, I work in a five by seven room because that is the only thing that I have as an option right now as a working mom with two kids under two in New York City, or two kids under three now. Um, but I would, I would say that what I love about um, you in our conversation is you are looking at me and I feel connected to you because this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. When it comes to looking into the camera, I recommend that when you're presenting to a larger group, when you're mm -hmm. trying to engage individuals, especially if you've never met them before. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say you want to only look into the camera. You want to look down and check individuals' body language, check for technology or accessibility issues. But if it's, you know, if there's high trust, then I also often just recommend to be yourself and break those barriers of having to look in a perfect way. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. What about distance? So when you said that, I realized you might you might not have seen my hands at all. You know, I'm I'm not a I'm a little bit of a hand talker, but I'm not a huge gesticulator. Would it be would I be better off here? I actually think that your positioning is perfect, Howard. You you are a role model of good oh. you know, body language because I can see you your face really well. If you want to use your hands, you'll bring your hands up yeah, but yeah. you're also your video quality is very clear and your background is beautiful with the bookshelf that allows me to not actually focus on the background but just be able to be focused on you oh good good so uh to thank my wife for the blue sheet <laughs> it's perfect awesome awesome um so let's well thank you i feel <laughs> i feel inordinately proud of myself for something that i had very little to do with actually um Let's talk about the the, the rules because I think they when you understand those you can sort of extrapolate mu much of the rest. So let's the, go through the rules. I want to share the four laws of digital body language. The first law 
is to value visibly. In a traditional body language world, valuing others visibly meant taking them out to dinner, showing cues, with traditional body language. Valuing others visibly today is valuing their time, valuing their inboxes, valuing their schedules. The new art of respect is valuing time of others. Mm. The second law is to communicate carefully. I'll, I'll bring it into one quick story. One of my clients sent a message to his boss, Tom, that said, do you want to speak Wednesday or Thursday? And the, the boss's response was yes. And in many ways, reading messages carefully is the new listening and writing clearly is the new empathy. The third law of digital body language is to collaborate confidently. Today, confidence isn't gregarious body language or having the deepest voice pitch. Confidence is shown by saying what you'll do, doing what you'll say, following through on your commitments so individuals don't have to chase you down multiple th times to get what they need. It's also about giving others the freedom to take conscious risks so they, they can do their best work. The fourth and final law is trust totally, which is really the integration. Once you've valued visibly, communicated carefully and collaborated confidently, trust totally happens when you have a culture where everyone feels safe enough to speak up, where we don't rush into anxiety or paranoia if we don't hear back from someone, if they're on mute or we get an unclear subject line. And the opportunity is for all of us to implement these four laws, to take this moment after a year of a digital shift to make sure we don't just go back to work, but to reimagine work with better digital body language. This isn't just going to help us remotely. It's going to be a key critical skill in hybrid work here to stay. Right. And, so, and value visibly was another moment for me of realizing something, snobbishness or something. I felt like like clicking like or a thumbs up in a Zoom meeting, it just felt, it felt so easy, like it was, it was too cheap. So I didn't do it. And by not doing it, I'm communicating, so you, you can't not communicate, right? So I was communicating something. Um, I mean, I guess in many ways, I just feel like a, a digital curmudgeon, like, like this, is, this is like what we have to make do with because we've lost the real thing. And I think one thing you're saying is that, yeah, there is, there's huge value in face-to-face, -face, in telephone, and these other languages are not less than. You know, it reminded me, I was, I was reading today a piece about, um, from a linguist, about AAVE, AAV, Amer African-American Vernacular English, and how it's easy to, for people who don't understand it to look down on it and saying, well, that's not real language, but pointing out, no, this is the same as they did in, ancient, you know, in, in uh, uh, Latin, and this is a, you know, a Germanic thing. Like to appreciate, like you're helping me to appreciate digital as a real language and not just some sort of pigeon uh, degraded form of what we should be doing. That's exactly right. We are all navigating this together. And uh, in many ways, digital body language is a complement to traditional body language. It is also actually in many ways changing our traditional body language. And that's one of the most surprising things I found in my research. Because we are spending so much online time online, we are more likely now to multitask during face-to-face -face meetings, to think in bullet points, or expect people to think in like an email bullet pointed format in face-to-face, -to, -face, to look down at our phones and miss a lean in in a conversation. And, and so one of the opportunities we have is to make sure that we're relearning our skills in traditional body language and just as much the importance of getting creative with the power of digital body language. I'll give you one example that I think is really important. One of um, the uh, leaders that I interviewed for my book is a man named Brad who ran a team and there were two different direct reports he had that had their own teams and they had Slack channels. And one of his team members, a female, had a Slack channel with everyone had bullet points, perfect punctuation and grammar in the Slack channel. It was clear uh, and concise. And when Brad read the chain, he understood exactly what work was happening and in what formats. Then he had another team member that ran a, a Slack channel with GIFs, memes, emojis, and he had no clue what was really happening. But what he realized was that over time, the output and the product was the same of both team member, both teams. And if he were to belittle or change his other team members' cultural digital body language style, it would have hurt the work product. And so I think we have to be ourselves 
But what's important is we shouldn't infringe and impose our styles on others. Mm, yeah. So one thing that I'm I'm wondering whether I should be concerned about. So we've we've heard a lot about communication on social media, right? Facebook, Twitter. That there's things about that because they are advertising supported platforms, the algorithms can twist us. Right? The AI is working on us, and when we're talking face to face, there's no intermediary making money off of that. But even on Slack, on Zoom on Google, on Microsoft Teams, there's, there's somebody making a profit in between you and me. Does that ever get in the way? Is that something we should be conscious of? I think that we should all be conscious of it. There, there is, you know, the, there is a constant fear that, you know, are we, are we slaves to the digital world or are we, you know, or are we the owners of the digital world? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, um, we're at great risk of, uh, of you know, not fostering that true connection because perhaps we will become so biased by ads that are around us or certain beliefs that are shared on our Facebook page based on who we follow and the news uh, outlets that we read. And, and so I, I recommend that we try to be conscious of I would call it digital body language diversity, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that we are inclusive of different individuals and use what's good about these channels. Uh, so with Zoom, we can be less geographically biased to who was in the room or in the office and include anyone to be part of the conversation. We can change board meetings so that constituents of that nonprofit or effort can actually zoom into a board meeting and talk to board members when oftentimes there's so much disconnection between those making the decisions and those impacted by the decisions. Hmm. At the same time, uh, you know, I can't fight just the, the fear of advertising and how it's shaping all of us in our minds. I think, you know, there are better experts on that and how to fight the fears of it. Uh, I, I hope to, you know, really be part of the conversation about how we use it for good because we know it's not going away. Right, right. I never thought about that, that Zoom can really be an equalizer um, in terms of, you know, either the randomness or people, I guess I, I learned that I can move people around on the, on the Hollywood Squares board and, and like center people who are talking and, um, and that, yeah, there is, there is a, with Zoom, there is not necessarily a hierarchical table. In many ways, uh, the hierarchical table and the clicks, the side gossip conversations have been eradicated. Yes, there's still, you know, side gossip happening in direct IMing chat tools during meetings. And I would say that's in many ways the replacement of the sidebar conversations. And, you know, the person that's speaking or sending the agenda is kind of like the person that's at the head of the table now. Uh, but one of the things that we don't get is sort of instant impressions when someone walked in the room. You know, if someone walked in upset, you, you knew to sort of check in on them before the meeting. If someone walked in really excited, uh, you knew that they were ready to get started. If someone walked in, uh, you know, with an umbrella after like a rough morning walking through the rain, you know, to just like give them a breather. We don't know all of those things when we walk in, when we zoom into a call today. And so even just having a quick three minute icebreaker, checking in with people, but being a little, uh, you know, scripted about it is good. Asking, you know, about one win of the one win of the day, one challenge of the day or something specific and going around can be helpful just to check in before you get started. Mm -hmm. I have a weird question that just came to me. Um, if you were the designer in charge of Zoom 2.0 or some similar tool, do you have any thoughts about what you would do differently to make it better? Like blue sky, like anything's possible? Let's call Eric and advise some of these ideas to him. Uh, you know, the CEO of Zoom, <laughs> a, couple of, a couple of ideas. Um, the first idea is I believe that there should be a tracker of how much time each person speaks in the meeting, a data tool, <laughs> so that we can avoid certain people over talking in most of the meeting and certain people under talking. And I think that at the end of every meeting, it should pop up so that we can see where we truly inclusive 
in this meeting? And how do we make sure that we're more thoughtful of including everyone? And, and I think with a quick data visualization of that, it would be pretty amazing and open eyes of individuals of how little certain individuals are speaking versus others. Another example is I think that at the end of a Zoom meeting, we should have uh, an NPS, like a net promoter score rating afterwards, where we should rate the quality of the meeting. Was there a clear agenda? Did we get through everything? Was time valued? Did people multitask? Uh, just a few simple questions to score it. And I think that will change the behavior of both attendees and especially the host in being prepared. Uh, the third thing is I know that Zoom is already innovating around this, but being able to quickly gather a meeting recap of what happened, who's involved with what, what are the action items, I know that usually one person is doing this in the meeting, but they're not often sent out immediately after. So mm -hmm. a quick summary or synthesis that gets everyone on the same page. We all know what to do because we have too many meetings and it's hard to remember what happened in the last meeting or the meeting a week ago on something. So taking that extra step or you know, uh, quantifying it or using data, using Zoom could go a long way in helping us all. Those are three examples. I hope Zoom will hire me to help them a bit more. Wow, I'm impressed. I just that was a left field the uh, hardball, and you knocked it out of the park. What that first one was really powerful for me because first of all, I'm thinking, oh gosh, I do not want to see that data for myself. Like that, that's a little bit too much feedback. And there, I, I spent a couple of years part of a group of sort of self improvement, you know, sort of no holes barred encounter, talking to each other, trying to make each other better. And at one point there was like, you know, it was like 25 of us in the group. And at one point the leaders um, were addressing this issue of inequality of expression. And they asked us to line up from on one side of the room, the people who contribute the least to the group and the people who contribute the most. And first of all, we couldn't do it. Like people are constantly like stepping in front of each other. And second, whenever like, half of the people were looking at the other half saying, you've got to be effing kidding me. You are so clueless about how, where you are in this line. And to, to, ha to have it, um, to have data visualization about it seemed like it would, it would be shocking. Yeah, I think it would provide a new level of self-awareness that could help us all. <laughs> Great. So I, I want to ask you a personal question, which I think was invited by your introduction, which you're talking about yourself. And if you feel like it's too personal or you don't want to talk about it, we can all cut it out. But the, like the part that, that really got to me um, was you're talking about right, right after 9-11, um, seeing your family members, your father, people who looked like you suddenly regarded as other, as alien, as unwanted, as suspicious. And I'm just, I'm trying to imagine for myself, like to be empathetic to what that was like and what kind of effect that had on you as, as a young person. And here we are in this digital world in which it's easier than ever to sort of hide your body, to hide your essence. And, I, and I'm wondering, I don't even know what the question is, except like just to throw out that observation and, and, and see if, the, if, if you have a, a response. After 9-11, uh, growing up in uh, you know, a conservative suburban neighborhood outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, I did feel and my family really felt uh, you know, under suspicion. And there was one specific moment. Uh, I was at a you know, local community center at a, at a you know, sports practice. And when I came out, uh, I saw my father being interrogated by police officers because while he was waiting for me, he was a local cardiologist in a nearby hospital. We lived 10 minutes away from there. Someone uh, had called the cops on him because they deemed him suspicious. Uh, he's a tall Indian man with a mustache, <laughs> you know, the typical Indian doctor immigrant story. And I, I remember watching him you know, uh, using his own body language to show respect. He is, you know, eye contact direct, his palms wide open, uh, you know, signaling a deference to the officers, you know, getting frisked and following, you know, all the requests of the officers. Uh, and I remember after that um, being so upset. I was so upset. I was angry at my father for being so respectful when I saw racial profiling. 
Um, and I was also angry, you know, my father is very generous. He gave a lot of money that year to the 9-11 fund. And I, I remember him telling me, uh, you know, when we talked about that experience, he said, Erica, body language saved my life that day because I was able to show that I was not a terrorist and I was someone who is a citizen in this community. And it really struck a chord with me. It really uh, led me to reimagine how we build empathy with body language. And it stuck with me through the rest of my life. And I think that in today's world, body language still is the crux of the best ways to show empathy and connection. But when we don't have it, when we want to connect with our friends in India, in the UK, and you know, in California, when we're in New York, we have to also begin to learn the power of digital body language because it will allow us to build that empathy and connection even from afar. Hmm. But, like, but if I feel, you know, I'm cis white male, like I'm, I'm the avatar for most things, um, for someone who is not, like I have, I, I, I have a coaching uh, prospecting call tomorrow with someone with a, a gender non-specific name. I literally have no idea who's gonna you know, show up male, female, non-binary, I had no idea. And I found, I found that bothering me, like, like somewhere, like I feel uncertain about it. And like, suppose the person's camera doesn't work and they have an intermediate voice. So, like there's ways in which um, we can sort of, I don't know, either protect ourselves, you used the word mask earlier. Um, and you know, and it's, it, I don't wanna live in a world in which I am valued higher than someone who has a different gender or different skin tone or different, but that's, you know, that's the fact of the world. And how do we, how do we deal with that digitally? You know, in a way that your, you know, your father was deferential and the truth is it saved his life. And the truth is it shouldn't have been that way. It shouldn't have had to. I think, I think that these are some of the challenges of, you know, about human nature and it's not just America it's not just you know part certain parts of the world we all carry our own biases and our histories and our stories and I believe that this year has been a great reckoning where certain uh you know certain behaviors have been amplified and other behaviors you know negative behaviors have been amplified and positive behaviors around inclusion have been amplified and i'm not blaming either or because we are all shaped by our stories so there is not uh, someone who's better or not you know not as good i think i think that the opportunity we have is perhaps for you howard to say it doesn't matter whether it's a female or male or someone not you know who's gender non binary i think perhaps we should just come with open eyes and you know you can also google a person and pretty much find everything about them now but um you know but check our own biases and if we you know we're simple enough to just check our bias assume great intent we may be surprised about, uh, you know, amazing connections that we'll make that we didn't expect. Mm, yeah, that's that's beautiful because yeah, what what comes up for me is not knowing, shows me what is important to me that I didn't realize was important to me. Exactly. Mm. So I want to I really want to focus on in the time we have remaining the value visibly because in my world and with most of the people that I deal with, that's where I think the biggest mistakes get made or with where the most most hurt comes from. And you kind of opened up a whole minefield of ways in which I, I see myself realizing that I'm not valuing people visibly and I might even be dissing them. So like one, one thing is about timing. Like it never, I never really thought about what it means um, when, I, when I don't respond to a text right away or the next day versus email versus voicemail. Talk, talk a little bit about how time and value uh, connect. One of the things I recognized in my research is that there are high levels of anxiety from certain individuals when they deal with slow or no responses from other individuals. And a lot of it has to do with how big the trust gap is between them, as well as how big the power gap is between two individuals. I, I, I have lots of examples in the book around individuals who, you know, will stay up all night, you know, work on a deck, then get it to their team leader, 
if they were in the office, they would have seen their team leader giving it to them and they would have seen their leader's relief in their face and the thank you and felt valued. But in a digital world, if they send that deck, it goes through in the digital ether and then that leader doesn't respond immediately after hard work done or just responds with a K period. This does not cause people to feel valued visibly in today's world. Instead, they feel disrespected. And so some simple things you can do is take the time to truly respond. I am not trying or condoning constant email responses at all. I'm saying, you know, if someone's working hard for you, taking that extra step to say, got it, you know, I'll get back to you soon, or thank you so much, not just THX period, which I believe is like an acknowledgement of an email. It's not a true thank you. Go above and beyond to show radical recognition. Let people know when they did a great job. Be specific about why. CC them on the you know, conversation by email that you share with senior leaders about the work so that they can feel acknowledged and respected. Radical recognition is a huge part of valuing visibly. The other thing that I recommend is what I like to call becoming a meeting ninja. We have to think like ninjas now and be smarter about our meetings. Have less meetings have tighter meetings, send agendas in advance, have a meet a note taker who's sending out a, an email recap. I like to say that's the new virtual handshake. And simple things like this just value people's time and allows them to do their best work. Another simple tip I recommend to value others visibly in meetings is to initiate what I call the Zoom BCC. Now, what I mean by this is if someone's like, just like email, if they're on a chain, but they don't need to be on it any longer, you may BCC them so you don't reply all. Similarly, initiate a Zoom BCC where they don't need to be in a meeting anymore. Go into the chat and write BCC to these people so that they don't feel our guilt and end up multitasking through half of your meeting. Mm. I love that. Um, but when we're talking about multitasking, though, there's the intention to do it and there's also the addiction, right? I've seen, I've seen like for myself, like I'm constantly, like my, my hands are moving. I have all these keyboard shortcuts for mail, for Twitter. And I'm like talking to you and I can feel like in my body, like not actually not at this moment, but there are times when I'm on a call or, or especially in a meeting where I'm, I don't have to be performing that my hands on the, their own accord are going to, Ooh, did I get an email? Ooh, did I, you know, I heard a ding. like before, like 20 minutes ago, I heard a ding on my phone. I realized I hadn't shut the sound off. And like, there's this thing in my head going, who dinged, who dinged. And like, it's, so it's beyond just having intentions. There's got, do you have, do you have suggestions for actually managing these digital addictions? We have an immense level of digital addiction. It has only become more unprecedented and heightened in the last year when we are working remotely. We can't you know, move around or get out or maybe go for those walks or, or go to that uh, party that we used to to get off of our phones. You know, A couple of general rules of thumb, I recommend if you can have a certain cutoff, a time where you just shut off the devices, whether it's 7 p.m., 10 p.m., I don't 2 a.m., whatever you like to work, Take some time to get off the screen. It will allow you to be better on the screen. When you are in meetings, I do recommend to try not to multitask. People can tell. Uh, obviously, if it's a working session, that's a little different. You're taking notes. And, you know, if you if you if if it's someone you've never met before, you might want to say, I'm taking notes, just so they don't assume you're multitasking. But at the end of the day, I, I would say I'm definitely not the expert at uh, this stopping multitasking. I know the impact it can have. There's a great book that I recommend in the spirit of supporting other authors uh, called Indistractable by Nir Eyal. Mm. It's an excellent book that is all about uh, how to avoid distractions in our digital world that I'd recommend here. Gotcha. And, that, and that's hilarious because his first book was all about how to distract people. Exactly. <laughs> So he's he's like the, the criminal helping the cops now. Perfect. <laughs> right. um, so the other question I have is like, I, I can feel myself become, you know, this year becoming less embodied in a way. Like I, like we're here I am and, you know, I have a standing desk. So I don't know if you've noticed, like I fidget because like, oh, but when I sit, sometimes I'll, it's a, it's a, you know, up and down desk, sometimes I'll sit and I can realize, like, I haven't drunk water all day. I haven't paid attention. Like, I don't even, 
like my body feels like like I could if I could just upload myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know how do how like what do you what do you see if you if you did any research on this and what's the impact on just human beings with bodies with needs with sensations, uh, with intelligences that are that are going a little bit dormant. I'm a dancer. And I truly believe that our bodies give us answers that our minds never will. Hmm. And when I dance, when I move, uh, you know, I get clarity, I get creativity, I get inspiration, which led to writing this book. I think that we are at major risk of losing some of that, uh, you know, embodied leadership that you are talking about, which is so critical to how we lead, live, love, and connect. And so, you know, you are modeling it really in a wonderful way, Howard, through a standing desk as one example to really get up and walk around. I'd encourage if you don't have to be on video Zoom all day, have walk and talks with mm -hmm. those that you're connecting with. Know when to just pick up the phone versus scheduling a Zoom meeting. Don't just default to being on the screen all the time. Have shorter meetings and your meetings at the 25 and 55 mark instead of the 30 and 60 minute mark so that you have those five minutes to take a little quick walk, get some water. This is not trivial anymore. It is critical to human performance. And if we do not take care of ourselves and our bodies, how can we take care of others? Mm, I love that. And I love that you talked about dancing because one of the things I started doing, I have a, a weekly group coaching call and this has been, you know, it's about sort of health and happiness and you, this has been a tough year. We've now decided to end every call with a dance. So I, I figured out how to play Spotify through Zoom and we somebody picks a song and we all just dance in our in our squares. And it's hilarious. It is. That is amazing. And I hope to join one of those calls, Howard, so I can dance with you. Oh, you're invited. I'll sell that. That'd be great. Um, anything you want to, we're, we're at the um, 52 minute mark, so I want to honor the five minute break. Uh, anything that you want to say about this or the book or anything that I haven't asked about? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, for all those listening, you can get my new book, Digital Body Language, everywhere, Amazon, Audible, Barnes and Nobles, you name it. Uh, you can also check out my website, ericadewan.com. I have a- Spell that for people who aren't gonna go read it. E-R-I-C-A-D-H-A-W-A-N.com. On my website, I have a free digital body language quiz that you can take to understand your digital style so that you can make sure you're valuing visibly, communicating carefully, collaborating confidently, and trusting totally in today's world. And I hope that you'll gift the book for your boss, your colleague, your friend, your family member to really start a revolution of how we can all build trust and connection no matter the distance. Oh, awesome. That's fantastic. Did you read the Audible book yourself? I did. You'll be was hearing that... from directly from me. Oh, how was that? Have you done that before? First time. It was a lot of fun. How was your body language while you were reading? Were you in like, like a tiny little claustrophobic room or was it fun? Or I got to stand up for most of it. Uh-huh. Cool. Um, and like, I don't know why I'm so interested in this, but uh, did you have the choice, like getting some voice actor to read it or you yourself? And what was your thinking? In my previous book, uh, there was a voice actor who did it, and I didn't even get the choice or the offer to do it. Um, in this book, I actually specifically requested it because uh, some of my biggest fans of my last book said, I wish you had read the Audible book. Mm. Yeah, I guess it, it's, it's another, like audio is a form of digital these days. Exactly. So, Erica Dewan, this is so great to talk to you. I feel like this this really is going to save me from a lot of um, un, unknown pain and embarrassment, as well as known pain and embarrassment, it really, it really opened my eyes to a whole bunch of assumptions I'd been making that I think have been getting in my way. And I would encourage everybody, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it up here for, uh, for those of you watching on, on YouTube. So this is, this is going to go out into the world and um, do great things, create lots of, of compassion and connection. And it's an honor to uh, have this conversation with you. Thank you so much, Howard.